Today's portion is 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 to 22. That's a full chapter. Before we go into that chapter, a quick recap. Um, we saw that last time that Samuel, the third part of Samuel is what we are in. And the third part of Samuel, 1 Samuel, is from chapter 7 to 15. It has three subsections. The first section was chapter 7 on its own, and it gave a little more depth into Samuel's ministry in Israel. And we saw in that chapter how Samuel was a very effective minister. He was a judge, he was a prophet, he was a priest. And his ministry was very fruitful because Israel benefited a lot. They turned back to the Lord from their earlier rebellion, and they repented and how they began to... Uh, understand and come back to the Lord, right? Verses 8 to 12, which is a section that we are in now, moves from uh, Israel takers. There's a change that happens in Israel history. Israel now wants to move from the kingship of God to a monarchy. And we are beginning to, that's what we will begin to study today. The last subsection of the third part is 13 to 15, where we study about the kingship of Saul. Okay. A quick recap of what happened in chapter 7, verse 12. At the end of the chapter, we saw Samuel took a stone. He named it Ebenezer, and he placed it between Mizpah and Shen. This is after this battle that they had with Philistines, with the Philistines, where they routed the Philistines. And when Samuel named it Ebenezer, he was saying that the word Ebenezer means up to here the Lord has helped us. So we concluded last time, last time the theme was about the grace of God, right? How God in his grace forgave them from their past. In his grace, how we provided for them in their present. And in his grace, it was his grace that would lead them in the future. And that's what Samuel is also telling them, right? When he places memorial stone there, it was to remind Israel to be humble always because they were in a storyline of grace. Their entire history was a storyline of grace. He wanted them to remember that it was by God's grace that they had come to that point. And it did not end there. They had to move on because God's plan, God had a bigger plan for them. And they had miles to go in this storyline, in their storyline. And it was the stone would serve as a reminder that the God who brought them this far would take them to fulfill the purpose God had for them. Okay. So we also learned that memorial stones like this are important in our faith lives too, because they are spiritual mile markers. Every memorial that we put up, that we put up to remind ourselves of the grace that we experienced in the past, will give you confidence in the grace that will sustain you today and the grace that will give you the confidence to face tomorrow. Right? So that's where we concluded last time. Today, we are stepping into, we said, uh, we see Israel taking a turn. They are going to demand that they want a monarchy as the form of their government. Okay, so there's a departure in Samuel chapter eight. First Samuel chapter eight. There's a departure in character for Israel. In chapter seven, we saw a repentant and obedient Israel, totally submissive to the Lord's kingship. But now Israel wants a king, right? And Though this chapter, this change in Israel is happening between chapter 7 and 8, from the first verse of chapter 8, we can see that this portion that we are studying is when Samuel is old. So though they are adjacent chapters, there is there are several years that has passed between what was narrated in chapter 7 and what is being narrated in chapter 8. Okay, So over time, Israel has again forgotten. Right? They have forgotten what God has done for them in chapter 7. And they are now in chapter 8 where they're demanding a king. And in this chapter, we will see that both Samuel and God, and God are not happy with Israel's demand for a king. So that brings up the question, did God intend that Israel will never have a king, that he will always be their king? When we look at earlier portions of the scripture, Genesis chapter 17, 1 to 6, Genesis chapter 17, 15 to 16, Genesis 15, 35, 9 to 11, and Genesis 49, 10, we see that in God's plan for Israel and for the whole creation, God had plans for a king, right? He had promised Abraham and Jacob that through their descendants would come kings, right? And so clearly, God had a plan for king, for a king for Israel. 
the question is, then what is wrong with Israel's demand? And that's what we will explore this time. Okay, so the focus in this chapter is on Israel's demand for a king. In, and we said that God already had it in plan for them. And we also see in Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 20, because God had a plan for a king, he also had a, a set of, he, he had given them an understanding of what his choice of a king would be like. And he had also laid down in Deuteronomy the instructions for how his king would conduct himself. Okay, so that's the context in which we study today's chapter. So getting into the chapter that we are studying, was first section is verse 1 to 9. In the sixth section, we see that Israel has decided that the leadership by judges, right? For those who are new, the word judge is a person, a leader in Israel whom God raises up. Right, and usually the judge is someone who arbitrates between them. That's why the word judge, whenever there's a conflict or whenever there's some contentious issues, but the judge is not just purely someone who arbitrates. He would also lead them. He would be a priest. He would be a prophet, and he would be a leader. He would even lead them in battle. Right. So he was a total leader. And the key thing was God raised up judges for Israel at every point in their need. But now in this chapter, we see that Israel is saying, we are tired of the leadership of judges. This is not good enough for us. We are in a stage in our growth as a nation that we think we need a king, right? If you peek ahead into chapter 12 of First Samuel, verse 12, you will see that it gives you some additional information why Israel demanded a king. So the question for us, keep in mind the portions that we just uh, quickly, briefly looked at Genesis uh, in Genesis when God had already promised them a king, right? So the question that we should discuss is, what was wrong with Israel's demand for a king? When early in the scripture, the patriarchs, that is Abraham and Jacob, God had already promised them that kings would be among their descendants. But then we see that God and Samuel are upset their demand for a king. So what was wrong? If God had already promised that, if that was already in his plan, why was Israel wrong in demanding for a king at this point? That's the first question for us to deliberate on. So let's just get into this, dig into this question. I think first question, um, if we recall Eli, when we were studying chapter two and three, we studied how Eli's sons, were also uh, not faithful to the Lord's service, right? And at that time, we looked at whether Eli, what was Eli's responsibility in that? So this chapter starts off with a focus on Samuel's son. So the first question we'll just look at, let's just get this out of the way. Was Samuel responsible for his son's behavior? Because clearly Israel, the trigger, the text tells us that the trigger or what was apparently the trigger for them to ask for a king was because they were dissatisfied with Samuel's sons, that they were dishonest and that they were. Uh, verse uh, 5 says, they said to Samuel, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all other nations have. So that seems to be the obvious trigger. We will dig in and see whether that was a real reason. Okay. So Samuel was probably clearly wrong in appointing, self-appointing his sons as judges, because it was God who always raised Israel's judges based on their need. And I think Samuel was also guilty in part for not removing his sons from their position when they proved unfaithful and dishonest. But the text does not dwell on Samuel, whether uh, but instead, rather than dwelling on whether Samuel was responsible for his son's behavior, the text tells us in chapter 12, when you go to chapter 12, verse 1 to 4, that Samuel himself was blameless, right? He was unlike Eli. Samuel did not participate. He was not commissioning or participating in his son's wrong deeds. They were responsible for their own wrong deeds. Samuel instead was blameless. He was faithful. He was a honest judge and a priest. God gives evidence, testifies to that. So do the people in chapter 12, if you just peek ahead into chapter 12. Because Samuel asked them, did I do anything wrong? Did I demand stuff from you? And they say no. 
And in this chapter also, we see how God says, right? In verse 7, God tells Samuel, it is not you they have rejected, but it is me they are rejecting as a king. So from this chapter, and also in chapter 7, remember we saw how God had blessed Samuel through, I'm sorry, Israel through Samuel's ministry. So clearly Samuel was righteous and he was a good judge. He was a faithful uh, servant of the Lord. And it was clear from the earlier chapters, even Israel acknowledged that, right? Perhaps Israel was seeing that the same spirit was not in Samuel's son. It was obvious to them. So that is one of the reasons why it is at this point that they come and raise this objection. They say, give us a king. We know that is in God's plan that they would have a king in the future. So let's now look at what was wrong in demanding for a king, right? Like a lot of you said, there were two mistakes. And the first mistake was timing, right? Israel knew from the scripture that God had a plan to appoint a king for them. It would be a king who was not, who was in the world, but not after, not of the world. Like somebody mentioned, I think it was, uh, uh, was it Minnie who said a, a king uh, after God's own heart, right? Israel had their needs provided by God. So two things to remember. Israel knew that God had a king for them in, in his plan for them. And Israel was aware that in the past, God had provided all their needs. But time and again, there was evidence that they were always forgetful and impatient. And that's what the Lord tells Samuel. Just as they have done from the day that I bought them out of Egypt until this very day, they have rejected me and served other gods. Right? So timing, there is a problem. Israel is impatient. Many scriptures teaches the importance of waiting on the Lord. And this was their first failure. Their unwillingness to wait on the Lord's timing, right? Two important aspects of waiting, when we read, there are many scripture portions that deal with waiting on the Lord, right? And two things always stand out. That is stillness and faith. Psalm 37, 7 says, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Psalm 27, 14 says, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And in Isaiah 40, 30, it says, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. So have faith that God will renew your strength. So why is it so difficult to wait on the Lord? Israel suffered from that, right? From this impatience. So do we very often. When we look at the meaning of the word stillness, the English dictionary, the noun form of the word says stillness means deep silence and calm. Both those words are very significant. Deep silence allows you to hear very well, right? So you can hear the voice of the Lord. And calmness comes from, when are you calm? When you have confidence and faith. And faith comes from the knowledge of God. So Israel was forgetting their history. They had abundance of knowledge of God. They had forgotten their Ebenezer, the memorial stone that Samuel himself had raised up for them to remind them that thus far the Lord had helped us. So both these things, Israel was not still. They had forgotten. They were losing their ability to uh, be still and wait on the Lord. And their faith was shaken. Right. The second error is their motive, the reason why they wanted the king. Like all of you observed, Israel was demonstrating that they were dissatisfied with God's chosen method of leadership. And God's method of leadership was through his law and through his chosen judges, right? Israel was expressing a desire to be like all the nations around them. And what was wrong with that, to be like all the nations around them? Because in doing that, they were forgetting, they were rejecting God's purpose for choosing them and drawing them out of Egypt, right? Because God's purpose for Israel in Exodus 19, verse 5 and 6, at Mount Sinai, when he had drawn them out of Egypt, at Mount Sinai, this is what he told them. Now, if you diligently listen to me and keep my covenant, then you will be a special possession out of all the nations. For all the earth is mine, but you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So God's purpose for Israel was to be different from all the other nations. To be a holy nation means to be set apart. 
He wanted them to be a model nation, a priest, someone who intercedes for the others, right? So they were supposed to be a model nation, and they were supposed to lead the other nations, to set the path for the other nations. And they were rejecting that. Instead, they were saying, "We want to be like the other nations." And God's plan, if you look at Genesis, was to bless all the families of the earth through Israel. We did that brought this up last time, right? When God called Abraham, He said, "I will, I have blessed you." and i will make you a big a large a great nation and i will bless you why so that all families on the earth will receive blessings through you so abraham and israel were blessed so that they would be a blessing to all families on the earth so their motive was also wrong right they were rejecting god's purpose for them so with that let's come to the second question verses 10 to 17 when you reject god's plan and when you're impatient to wait for God's timing, there is going to be a cost, right? And Samuel in this portion is warning Israel that their demand for a king to rule over them will not be without consequences. And it is Im interesting in Deuteronomy 17, 16 to 20, if you have read that portion, you will see how God's model king was supposed to be, right? How he was supposed to be chosen and how he was supposed to be, uh, conduct himself, right? So compare what Samuel is in this the next question is compare the model that God had for them, for the king who would he would appoint for them, to the kind of king Israel was likely to get. This was not the right time for them to demand for a king. And at this time, the king that they would get was likely to have that choice of a king was likely to have consequences for them as a nation. So compare these two the model of a king that God had in mind and what was Samuel wa warning them in this portion about the king that they would get at this point in time? What would he be like? And what are the consequences for them? That's the next question to deliberate on. So first, we know that God wanted, uh, from this portion we can see that God wanted, in his concern for Israel, he wanted them to be forewarned about the consequence of their choice. Because verse 9 says, God instructs Samuel, you must warn them and make them aware of the policies of the king who will rule over them. Israel and God would hold Israel responsible for the consequence of their choice. Uh, in verse 18, uh, yeah, God says, in that day, Samuel predicts that in that day, you will cry out when they, they are oppressed by the king of their choice. You would cry out because the king whom you have chosen for yourself, because of the king you have chosen for yourself, but God won't answer on that day. So see the emphasis on the king whom you have chosen for yourself. Okay. So when we look at this portion, we, we can see that Israel was instruct, very interested in the functions and the benefits of monarchy. Whereas God, when you look at Deuteronomy, was concerned about the nature of human monarchy, right? So the key portions, words that keep repeating itself in this portion are take, demand, your best. These are the things that stand out in the way a king would behave, right? They are repeated in this portion. He would take your best. He would demand your tithe. He will take your daughters and use them as his employees. He will take the best of your land. He will take your sons and make them his soldiers. So a king, most kings, God is warning them that human kings, most kings are takers and not givers. They would enslave the people and not liberate them. Israel was looking for liberation. From all, the, from all the threats that surrounded them. But God was warning them that a king that you choose would be just the opposite. He would take and not give. He would enslave and not liberate. Whereas God's model for a king was someone who would serve and not be served, who, who, who's rational, who's, whose very motive would be to serve and not to be served. We know there's one king who, who testified, who, who said this of himself, right? We'll look at that portion later. So when you read Deuteronomy 17, verse 16 to 20, what God says is, he wants a king who would not accumulate wealth for himself. He would not get distracted by the many wives he marries from the, his duties to God and his people. He would always be obedient to the Lord's commandments and he would not exalt himself above all the people. So direct contrast to what Samuel was 
warning them about about how a human monarch that israel was not ready to find a person of this sort it was not the right point in their history for a, for a person of this sort to lead them right and in their impatience god was warning them that you're going to make a false start in your monarchy so god was not telling them that they would not have a monarch in the future a king in the future but he was saying at this point if you choose a king you would make a false start right saul would be the wrong choice we know that saul was the first choice and he would he proves to be the wrong choice israel should have waited for david a man after god's own heart right it was through david and david's line that we know the king of kings would come because isaiah prophesies that later right for a child is, has been born to us a son has been given to us right he will rule on david's throne and over david's kingdom establishing and strengthening it by promoting justice and fairness from this time forward and forevermore so god's plan was for david to be the first king and through david uh through david he would actually the the king of kings would come right and the who's the king of kings jesus himself and jesus testifies about himself in matthew 20 verse 25 to 28 he jesus says Uh, this is the time when i think the disciples some of them wanted to uh, ask him about who would uh, whether they would have a higher priority over the others right jesus told them you know that the rulers of the gentiles lord it over them and those in high positions use their authority over them but it must not be this way among you instead whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first must be a slave just as the son of man and he's talking about himself here right just as the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many so that was god's plan david first leading to jesus right but israel uh, sumai says uh, the way israel is behaving looks like a marriage that a son demands by blackmailing his father father explains the consequences but the son still wants it so the father says okay your will be done very true right and we know um, i'm sorry i i think i'll i'll pick up that thought that i just wanted to put on in in this question in this next question right so when we come to the last portion this question is not straight from this specific portion but i think we just have to look a little deeper and try to read between the lines get into the skin of the israelites and look at also compare what happened in chapter 7 right in chapter 7 we saw how that's a previous chapter how god was gracious and forgiving when israel was repentant and humbled and in chapter 7 israel experienced the power and the gifts of god's grace as a nation when they acknowledged samuel as their king right how the, when the philistines attacked them and they had they they overcame the philistines and how they had peace from the east to the west yet in this chapter we see when israel was challenged they insisted that they wanted a king to lead them right so the question is what are the real reasons we saw why it was wrong to ask for a king we saw some of the reasons early reasons we thought why they wanted a king but just think a little deeper put yourself in their shoes and try to understand the nature of their existence and what we know about israel and how they survived how they Uh, how the judges led them and ask and try to answer this question what could be the reason the real reasons israel wants a change in the type of leadership from a judge to a king so i know i'm asking you to be a bit speculative but just use your imagination a little okay so that's this question is just a short portion but reflect on the entire chapter when when you try to look at this question because this would also give us a clue as to what they thought would be different when they had a king compared to a judge so when you get into this pro- this portion what was israel's greatest wall of protection one was the voice of the lord leading them and the voice of the lord was through the leaders who interceded with god and through whom god spoke to them and their second greatest wall of protection was a god who would fight their battles 
Israel had no standing army, right? They came together to fight whenever they, it was needed, whenever their enemies attacked them. So they had no standing army. They were very loosely connected that way. And Israel seemed to have been tired of this, right? They were they were tired. They had a mandate from God to be different from all the other nations, but they were getting tired of this. They wanted now to be like the other nations. In, 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 this, in verse 19, when Samuel is warning them, after he has warned them, they still insist, no, but we will have a king over us that we may be like all the other nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. So they seem to be tired of depending on God for protection. They wanted a standing army like the other nations. They wanted what they thought a standing army and a king would make them strong and independent. If you peek into chapter 12 of Samuel, verse 12, you will see that one of the actual reasons, the triggers for why they asked Samuel for a king is, Samuel tells them, when you saw King Nahash of the Ammonites advancing against you, you said to me, no, a king will now rule over us, even though the Lord your king, Lord your God is your king. So combined with the fact that they were not confident about Samuel's son's leadership, when they saw the threat of a king, they began to compare these two and put it together. And they said that, oh, a king, standing army, a fixed structure, all of this is better than just relying on the Lord and relying on the leaders that God chose for us. So they were tired of the discipline of waiting on the Lord. They were a nation that had to be different and they were a nation that had to wait on the Lord because the Lord was their greatest wall of protection. They were tired of that, right? So there are consequences of this. We saw earlier when Abraham and Sarah were tired of waiting on the Lord, and on the Lord's timing, they produced Ishmael instead of Isaac. When Israel was tired of waiting on God and his timing, they got Saul as a king instead of David. But we know that God will never step off his throne. Because in Isaiah 46, 10, God says, my plan will be realized. I will accomplish what I desire. So that's the key thing to take out of this portion, right? Is God wants us to wait on him patiently, have faith. And when we are impatient, when we are tired of waiting, you will make mistakes like Abraham and Sarah did, like Israel did. But God is always in control and God's purpose and plan will be fulfilled, right? So with that, let's come to our breakout question. So we see that this, this story repeats itself, not just in the portion we studied today, we know that God's model for a king was very different from the type of king mere man could ever be. Who then could be an ideal king? About thousand years later in that history, Israel was again, we see Israel again waiting for a Messiah king who delivered them from the Romans. Yes, I'm speaking about the New Testament time, right? Would Israel recognize and receive the Lord's chosen king when he arrives? John 1.11 summarizes the answer to that in just one sentence. John says, he came to what was his own, but his pe own people did not receive him. When you read John 18, it's a very interesting portion, 33 to 38. This is the portion that describes Jesus being brought to Pilate, right? Uh, for, to stand trial. The, the, the Sanhedrin and the chief priests had already decided to put Jesus to death, but they had no legal authority to sentence someone to death. Only the Romans could. So they bring him to Pilate and they accuse him of being a criminal. And they wanted a crime that would be significant in the eyes of the Romans. And so they said his crime was that he claimed to be the king of the Jews because they know that that would alarm the Romans, right? Jesus did not. They were waiting for a king. Israel was waiting for a king, and Jesus did not meet their expectations of the waited, uh, the much-awaited Messiah King. This is similar to a lot of our circumstances. When we have challenges in our lives, what kings do we turn to for deliverance? Right? In that portion of the trial, Jesus tells Pilate, for this reason I was born, and for this reason I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. So put this together. 
when we are challenged when we go through difficult circumstances in our lives what kings do we turn to for our deliverance and what is jesus saying just before saying this he tells pilate also that my kingdom is not of this earth right and my kingdom is in effect from above so put this together and that's a question for our breakout session okay okay so we will just uh, close the session that's my closing slide so if you have read that portion right john chapter 18 verse uh, i think 33 to 38 jesus on trial before pilate if you look at the last part of that actually pilate was on trial because pilate had asked jesus are you the king of the jews do you claim to be a king and jesus in effect tells him yes i am a king but not a king that you think of not my kingdom is not of the earth and he says that uh, is the that last part that i had in the question for this reason i was born jesus told him and for this reason i came into the world to testify to the truth everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice and actually pilate asks we see that actually the tables had turned and pilate asked jesus what is truth it's interesting that he didn't say what is the truth he said what is truth and jesus had already answered that question in john chapter 14 verse 6 when he said i am the way the truth and the life all of those are noun forms right jesus is the way he is the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me so that's the thought i just want to leave leave you with jesus is the truth the way and the life right and every time when we pray when we pray the lord's prayer we pray your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven so we are acknowledging the kingship of the lord in our lives so just today when we pray the lord's prayer together remember that uh our next study will be from first samuel chapter 9 on 24th